morning, Randall. You all ready for Christmas? You all ready for an end of the semester? You all ready for more papers and exams? Ah, oh, it just dies down from there. Amen. Luke records that Jesus was approximately 30 years old when he began his public ministry. He testifies that it was under the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar, which would have put it around AD 28, when John began preaching in the wilderness of Judea, preparing the way for the Lord. And John's ministry was very short as Jesus came on the scene. And for a short while, they were kind of coexisting in their respective areas. But Jesus increased and John decreased until he was arrested. But Jesus himself was about 30, being the son of Joseph, who was the son of Heli, who was the son of Mathat, who was the son of Levi, who was the son of Melchi, who was the son of Janna, who was the son of Joseph, who was the son of Mattathias, who was the son of Amos, who was the son of Naom, who was the son of Esli, who was the son of Nagi, who was the son of Maeth, who was the son of Mattathias, who was the son of Simei, who was the son of Joseph, who was the son of Judah, who was the son of Joanna, who was the son of Reza, who was the son of Zerubbabel, who was the son of Salathiel, who was the son of Neri, who was the son of Melchi, who was the son of Adi, who was the son of Kozan, who was the son of Almodam, who was the son of Er, who was the son of Jose, who was the son of Eliezer, who was the son of Jorim, who was the son of Mathat, who was the son of Levi, who was the son of Simeon, who was the son of Judah, who was the son of Joseph, who was the son of Jonan, who was the son of Eliakim, who was the son of Malia, who was the son of Menan, who was the son of Matatha, who was the son of Nathan, who was the son of David, who was the son of Jesse, who was the son of Obed, who was the son of Boaz, who was the son of Salmon, who was the son of Nashon, who was the son of Aminadab, who was the son of Aram, who was the son of Ezra? And Ezra was the son, of course, as you go further down, Ezra was the son of who? You don't know, do you? As you go through it, he was the son of Perez, who was the son of Judah. Judah was the son of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac. Isaac was the son of Abraham. Abraham was the son of Terah. Terah was the son of Nahor. Nahor was the son of Saruk who was the son of Regal, who was the son of Phalek. And Phalek was the son of Heber, who was the son of Salah. Salah was the son of Canaan, who was the son of Apoxad. Who was the son of Shem, who was the son of Noah. Who was the son of Lamech, who was the son of Methuselah. Who was the son of Enoch. Who was the son of Jared. Who was the son of Mahalaleel, who was the son of Canaan. Who was the son of Enos, who was the son of Seth. Who was the son of Adam who was the son of God. 75 generations, 76 if you use Jesus inclusively. And Luke traces it back that he is the one. So we want to talk a little bit this morning about the fact that Jesus is real. Jesus is real. So I wanted to talk about several things. Number one, I wanted to talk about the virgin birth. It's been talked about before, but I think it's important to see what happened and how it's recorded later in the New Testament Gospel writers. Both Luke and Matthew record that Mary was a virgin and that her birth was directly from God in terms of being pregnant. If you look at Luke chapter 1, verse 34, when the angel Gabriel appears to her, he tells us she's going to bear the Christ child, but this child is going to come from God. Now, she says, how shall these things be, seeing I don't know a man? He says, the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee. And that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. So from Luke 1, 34 through 36, it's recorded that she understands that God is going to get her pregnant. The seed of God is going to be in her womb. Now, six months later, at least, Joseph finds out, and Matthew records, that Joseph finds out Mary is pregnant. He knows he's not the father because they're betrothed, haven't been married, they haven't consummated the marriage yet. 
So he's trying to figure out how to divorce her without making a public scandal. While he's thinking of these things, the angel of the Lord comes to him and tells him not to fear to take Mary as his wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a child, and you shall call his name Jesus. And of course, he's going to forgive people of their sins. He's going to take away their sins. So he goes back. And he shows that Mary was also a virgin. Even though she had other children later, that's recorded in Matthew 13, 55, Mark chapter 6, verse 3, we know that Jesus was the firstborn, and they had not had sexual union at that time. It's amazing how they both recorded from two different angles, but they make sure that you understand that. Second thing I wanted to talk about is the lineage the lineage of Christ in both genealogies, both in Matthew's genealogy, which records uh, Joseph's genealogy, and Luke, which I believe records Mary's genealogy, uh, being affirmed through her husband's name. You will see that they both come from the seed of David, who, of course, was the son of Jesse. Now, this is foretold. The virgin birth was foretold in Isaiah 7:14, 7, 700 years earlier. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel. That was also ratified by Matthew in Matthew 1:23. But when you go further here, you'll begin to see that what we're talking about here with Jesus being born, not only of a virgin, but coming through the lineage of David. Then you'll see in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. He's going to order it upon the throne of David. Notice David is mentioned in there. You look at Isaiah chapter 11. It says there shall come out a rod out of the stem of Jesse. Who is Jesse? Jesse is King David's father. And a rod, not only a rod shall come out of the stem of Jesse, but a branch shall grow out of his roots, which means the Messiah will come from the lineage of Jesse. And it tells us that the spirit of God shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Those are the seven spirits of God that are mentioned in the book of Revelation. They are all going to come upon this Messiah. So now every time we hear a prophecy concerning him that details more, the devil knows it as well. He's picking up on these clues. He's going to come through a virgin. The virgin is going to come through the lineage of Jesse. Well, we know that much so far. And we know that they're also going to come from David, of course, because through the lineage of David comes David the king. Now, when we go into the New Testament, you begin to see in Luke chapter 2 how Caesar Augustus, who was the emperor of Rome, he's called Octavian, he gave forth a census where all the world had to be taxed. And they had to go back to the place of their nativity. Joseph, being from the house of David, had to go from Galilee all the way back to Jerusalem, or actually Bethlehem, which was the place where David was born. Now, I want you to watch how these circumstances fulfill prophecy. Of course, in Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it tells us that Bethlehem would be the place where the Messiah is going to be born, Bethlehem Ephrata. And that's just a few miles outside of Jerusalem. So they knew that that's where he's going to be born. But his parents are living 90 miles north in the Galilean area. So how does that happen? Caesar Augustus plans this census where they have to go back to their town. It happened to be that Mary was nine months pregnant when they arrived in Bethlehem. She gave forth the birth of Christ. Lay the child in the manger because there was no room for them in the end. So even though he was born in Bethlehem, he was raised in Galilee, in Nazareth. This is where you get the expression, Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth was a town in Galilee. 
So God is fulfilling the prophecy of his birth in Bethlehem. Now, what about Nazareth? Well, there were many discussions in the New Testament that went against anyone or any prophet being from Galilee. The chief priests and scribes were against any prophet coming out of Galilee. Even when Philip was getting Nathaniel, and he told him, hey, you got to meet this guy. This is the Messiah. Nathaniel said, hey, shall any good thing come out of Nazareth? And he said, come and see. So Jesus came out of Nazareth, and he started his ministry there. Well, Isaiah chapter 9 tells us, he talks about the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, Galilee of the Gentiles. That again is 700 years prior. Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness have seen a great light. And to them that sat in the region and shadow of death, upon them has the light shined. Watch this carefully. His ministry began in Galilee. That's where he was raised and grew up. But he was born in Bethlehem to fulfill the other prophecy. And the lineage was from Jesse and David to fulfill that prophecy. Just watch the series of circumstances that are fulfilling all of the prophecies. This is where the New Testament writers and the gospel writers are picking up on this. They're going back and notating that Jesus is fitting everything God said he would years in advance. He would be born of a virgin. He would come through the line of David and Jesse. He would, not only that, he would be ministering in Galilee. All of that is true. So the lineage, the virgin birth, all of these things were on his side. Now this is interesting because in the Gospel of John it shows several conversations where you begin to see people's impression of Jesus. The Jews were angry at him. They didn't like him. They were jealous of him. And so they were suppressing anyone talking of Jesus openly. But people were starting to give out their stories, their gossip, and their rumors. Jesus, on the way to Caesarea Philippi, he said, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So he's getting the gossip from his own disciples. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're one of the prophets. He said, Who do you say that I am? Peter said, You're the Christ. No question. But people were coming up with these discussions. In John chapter 7, verse 12, they're saying things like, you know, he's a good man. Other people were saying, no, he's a deceiver of the people. I mean, you're getting these rampant, totally contradictory visions of him and who he was. In John chapter 7, they're also amazed that this man knows letters and having never learned. In other words, he never went through the rabbinical schools like the rabbis, and yet he knows all of this stuff. Jesus says, because the doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. If any man do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether I'm speaking of God or whether I'm speaking of myself. So these controversies were going around constantly. Some were saying, isn't this man supposed to be of the seed of David, according to the scriptures? It says the Messiah comes from the seed of David and should come from where David was in Bethlehem. Well, that was an easy fix. All you have to do is go back in the records to see that he was born in Bethlehem. So they were arguing over things that they were trying to clarify. And so it showed that they didn't always have a firm rap on the prophets in Scripture, but they had some knowledge. But they were also fighting against the worldly system that is pushing against you believing in him. And for that reason, they weren't giving over to belief because to believe in Christ and to stand on it would have meant so much you had to pay, so much you had to lose, as it does today, which is why many people do not fully embrace the gospel. They may pick out certain parts of it, but there are other parts that they will deny. This is because the gospel challenges you in a way that no other religion does. The gospel challenges you on this that belief in Christ is absolutely necessary or you will die. In fact, you will not only die, you will go to hell forever and ever with no recourse. Not only that, it is sin that is the problem that will send you there and all have sinned. And Christ is the only remedy out of it. 
Now, these truths are very consistent in the New Testament. And yet, these are the things that challenge people to the degree that they push away from them. They want alternatives. Now, Jesus was born, he says, in John 18, 37, when he's talking to Pontius Pilate to bear witness unto the truth. And yet, people are looking for alternatives to the Bible for truth. And truth does not have an alternative. Otherwise, it's not truth. Truth is truth. And everything else that claims to be of it that is not truth is a lie. This is why John preached so vociferously when he was talking in 1 John. He said, who is a liar but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denies the Father and the Son. Whoever doesn't believe that Jesus Christ has come into the world in flesh is not of God. Now, of course, what that means is you would have to believe that Jesus was divine and incarnated in the flesh. And whoever preaches another gospel is absolutely of the devil. So alternative thinking, which is the crown jewel of modernity, is totally in opposition to the truth. And Jesus made it clear, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. In fact, he was crucified by telling the truth. He said in John chapter 7, verses 6 and 7, when he's talking to his brothers, he's telling them, the world cannot hate you, but me it hates, because I bear witness of it that the works thereof are evil. The world is trying to call evil okay in order to feel better about themselves. Jesus was here to bear witness of the evil of the world. And the evils are based upon God's law, not theirs. Therefore, when you're looking at things from God's perspective, it shows the intensity of the evil. Not believing in Christ is to deny the light when you're in darkness. And to deny the light when you're in darkness is worse than just being in darkness. These are the truths that all antichrists will always try to muddle and deny. Every religion, every cult, even those who come in the form of Christianity that preach otherwise are being used of the devil to take these truths away so that you don't face it. You know, we oftentimes talk about Adam and Eve and the garden. And when you watch in the garden in Genesis chapter 3, the way the serpent approached Eve is the way Satan approaches this world. And even though we think we've progressed, we still bring up the same issues that happened there. There was one thing God said not to do in the Garden of Eden. That was not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And the day you eat thereof, he said, you will surely die. Genesis 2, 16 and 17. Everything else God said yes to. You can eat of everything else. You can do anything you want. But just don't do that. When Eve is talking to the serpent in the garden, where does the serpent force her attention? The serpent will not say, look at how God is good and bless you to be able to do everything except that one thing. And that one thing is to protect you from dying. That's not the way he came at it, is it? He said, did God say you should not eat of every tree? Why can't you eat of this one? All of a sudden, Eve is trying to defend what God had said. You shall not eat of it. She even added, neither shall you touch it lest you die. The serpent came out with the lie. You shall not surely die. For God does know that in the day you eat thereof, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That same spirit is in humanity to become their own God. This is exactly what's going on in the earth today. Very prominently, the exaltation of the human soul, the proclamation that the human spirit is divine, we are divine beings living an earthly existence. We simply go back to that divine status that we always are. You'll hear that. New thought is very prominent today. It's really an old cult, but it's revived. You'll see it in many modern preachers. And it's the idea you don't need a God to repent to. There's no sin because with sin and hell, there's shame. So they're going to remove hell 
They're going to remove anything that makes you feel shame and guilt because they think those things are repressive to the human spirit. And if you don't have any shame or anything, you don't have to peddle yourself to a vicious, wrathful God who can't wait to throw you into hell. That's the picture that they paint of the Bible in order to get you to see a new way. You yourself are evolving to be God. You should not let anything stop you from that evolution. And in that evolution is really glory. To stagnate and believe the Bible is to be repressed. And to be repressed is to be stagnated in your spirit. And to be stagnated is what they call hell. So they remove hell as an actual place and replace it with a condition that they tell you to remove. Now I want you to see here in Genesis chapter 3, the serpent's cleverness. He said to Eve in verse 4, you shall not surely die. Once the consequence is removed, then the fear of God is gone. The love of God is gone. Everything is jeopardized. If hell is a place that people go for rejecting God, and it's so horrible, then how much important it is for you to believe God. How high is his authority that to violate it makes hell a justifiable place to go? Therefore, truth is not something that is optional. It is absolutely essential. And anything that keeps you from truth has to be avoided at all costs. That's the preaching of the gospel. Now, it never has to change because it's always right. But everyone will convince you it needs to change. Because if there's anything in your heart that is offended by God, and Jesus says, blessed is he who was not offended in me. He says it in Matthew eleven six 6, and Luke chapter 7, verse 23. People are offended. They're offended in hell. They're offended in the authority of having to do what God says. They're offended in things that the Bible says that, quite frankly, they don't want to do. Now, that spirit will increase. It's always been around. It's going to get worse with time. And if you don't settle that matter with truth, then you have no choice but to be entangled in the deception. And the deception is going to get stronger over time. In fact, God himself is going to orchestrate the deception against people who refuse the love of the truth. You see, they don't see God as loving. They see God as wrathful. They don't see God as hopeful that you're saved. They see God as putting hell in your way to keep you from being saved. They don't see that God loves everybody. They think that God has only picked out a certain sect of people, the Christians, and saves them, and he doesn't care about the rest. That's the narrative that's being painted. Just like Christians are a select group that he favors. Christians is anyone who believes he is the Christ. And he's calling everybody to believe that. And so those who reject the message are actually rejecting Christ and making him the offender. And they make those who reject Christ the progressives, the ones who are moving up. The great deception to trap you into hell forever and ever. I was telling my students years ago, I debated Carlton Pearson. Many of you may not know him. He was, a, he was mentored by old Roberts. I'm sure you've heard of him. And he was very high up. He was moved very high up. He had a big ministry, a huge ministry. And uh, he had the Azusa Street revivals every year where people from all over the world came to celebrate the start, the official start of Pentecostalism in America. And about 22 years ago, he decided to totally go into a different direction. He developed what he called the gospel of inclusion. And that is that the blood of Jesus was sufficient to save everyone. So everybody is automatically saved. Doesn't matter whether you're a wicked person or a good person. Doesn't matter what you've done, you're automatically saved. No need for faith. No need for repentance. No need for anything. You're automatically saved. He removed the doctrine of hell. He could not reconcile that with his theology. You don't know how many times in history people come up with that one. 
So he didn't like it, he removed it. Charles Taz Russell did the same thing with the Jehovah's Witnesses. Didn't like hell, he removed it. Now, if you're going by what you like, anybody can do that. If I'm going by what I want to be true, I can come up with something better than all of them. That's not the issue. The issue is to cohere with what is true and to hear what the authority that is over everything. That's God himself. They will try to make you believe that following that Bible is ignorant. Following that Bible is traditional and it keeps you stagnated and bound. When in actuality, following the Bible is the only light to keep you from the darkness. Now, that deception is going to continue to increase, which is why you have to be very strong in believing in Christ. People change what they want, don't want to believe into metaphors. If you'll notice, when the preaching is not talking about sin, if it's not talking about judgment, then it's really not talking about the truth of the power of Christ the Savior. Why appreciate his salvation when you don't think you've ever done anything wrong? The severity of the wrong only illuminates the power of the right. God is holy, and to take his word apart is to damage your eternal soul. What does it say in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19? If any man take away the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his name out of the book of life. If any man adds to these words, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. What did Moses say? Deuteronomy 4, 2. Thou shalt not add to the word of God, neither shall you detract from it. Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 32. Do not add to God's word, neither take away from it. What did Jesus say? Don't think that I came to change the law of the prophets. I came not to destroy, but to fulfill. Verily I say unto you, one jot, one tittle, till heaven and earth pass, will not pass from the scriptures until all be fulfilled. He said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Matthew 24, 35. He said in Luke 16, 17, it is easier for the universe to pass away than one jot or tittle of my word to fail. Isaiah said it in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 8, the word of God that lives and abides forever. Peter picked back up on it and said the same thing in 1 Peter 1, 25. The quotations are consistent. The power and the message is consistent. And basically, if you believe God, you're going to have to follow his word because to not follow his word is not to believe him. The deception is people are going to tell you that what they're saying is God's word and it's not. They're going to exalt their authority and their interpretive prowess over the word of God. They're going to tell you there's another alternative reading to the word of God and you all are stuck in the reading it the way it is. They're going to tell you all of these things. Because that's all they got. But it's going to be very enticing if you yourself are offended in God. It's going to be very difficult if in your heart you have not made Jesus your Lord. If you don't walk with him. If you don't trust him. Because that's how you're going to overcome. Revelation chapter 12 verse 11. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto the death. And let me tell you something. Physical death is not metaphorical. You don't metaphorically die and you don't metaphorically go into hell. And there's not a metaphorical Jesus. That's why the documentation is so important. God came in the world in flesh. Justified in the spirit. Seen of angels. Preached unto the Gentiles. Believed in in the world, received up into glory. It was a real Jesus who took upon himself a real body, a real human soul and mind, suffered a real death, and rose the third day in a real resurrected body. Forty days later, ascended back into heaven. Is at the right hand of the Father, as the scriptures foretold, and will be there until he returns 
to settle all accounts according to his word. Everyone will be judged according to his gospel, Romans 2.16, and according to the secrets of their hearts. There's nothing covered that God will not bring out on the table. Everything is there. The sad fact, the worst part in history, and I oftentimes mention this, in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment, when the multitudes are standing before God, those that have died and gone to Hades, to Sheol, the place of departed spirits for those who did not have faith and were not looking forward to the Messiah. From every age, they're going to stand there, both great and small. The Bible says the books are open, which means everything they've ever done is already recorded and is present. And then there's the book of life. Now, the book of life, there's two different ones. There's the book that God records everybody's life in. But the Lamb's book of life is for those who have converted truly to Christ. If your name's in that book, then your judgment is basically passed, at least as far as where your destiny is concerned. But if your name is not in that book, then you're going to be judged according to your works. I want you to look at this very carefully in verse 13. It says, the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in it. Now, I want you to understand this lake of fire, which we call Gehenna, which is hell. I want you to see how it is always interpreted scripturally. Death itself is going to be thrown into that lake. That's not a metaphorical fire, people. Satan is going to be thrown into the lake of fire. Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. In fact, the lake of fire is a preparation for the devil himself and his angels. Matthew 25, 41. There will be no more death. There will be no more hell as a preparation point to the lake of fire. That's the final, the second death. And then sadly, in verse 15 of Revelation 20, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was what? Cast alive into the lake of fire. Now, you might want to make that metaphorical if you want. But God has made it very clear. Jesus, when he's talking about the Soas parable, he lifts up the fact that at the end of the world, He's going to send forth his angels, and he's going to take out everyone and everything that offends and cast them into a lake of fire. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. At the end, Matthew 13, 49 through 51, he brings it up again, at least 49 and 50. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and they shall be cast into a lake of fire. Mockers will come up and say, that's crazy. I've heard one mocker say that God's got an anger management problem. That anybody, and that's exactly what they do. They do laughs to mock it. How can any intelligent person believe this stuff? This is stuff that the church has, in their opinion, put upon you to keep you bound, to keep you in some tradition that is wrong, to keep you pharisaical in your mentality. That's what they're going to say, and they're going to say more than that. And if you don't have Jesus in you to withstand that and to let that rub off your back, you're going to be taken. They're very clever and they're very sophisticated. And they talk with authority as if they know what they're talking about. And they don't know anything. Now, when they cross over death, they know now. And you can't come back from it. Carlton Pearson just died last week, prostate cancer. And on his deathbed, while he's dying, he's still propagating this stuff. That shows you how sin can lock you in. Even facing death, it will still deceive you into thinking you're right. Now, I'm convinced he knows now. It was once you cross over, you can never cross back. Now, we are the servants of Christ. And in this world, you're going to have to be strong in it. The facts are overwhelmingly clear. What we don't know is very little compared to what we do. And what we do know is very, very, very clear. There is a hell. There is a damnable place forever. 
and there is a heaven. God is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. 2 Peter 3, 9. Come to the knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2, 4. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked should repent and turn from his wicked ways. Ezekiel 18, 32. I mean, he talks all throughout. But everyone who in the Old Testament defied God's word died. And it's the second death type of die. Don't fall into that. Everybody's going to die. It doesn't matter. Huh. Makes all the difference whether you die in Christ or whether you die in your sins. It does matter. It's everything. And you've got to fight to retain that. Amen. God bless you. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and for these students. We ask, Lord, that you just upgird them and strengthen them as they're going into finals and research papers and everything, that they end well in this semester and be strong to come back next semester uh, in uh, a renewed vigor. We just pray this. And we pray for the staff and faculty as well as we have to go through these things as well, that you just keep us right and on course in Christ's name. Amen. God bless you. Dr. Ledbetter. Today we'll, <coughs> we'll be praying for the Mongbua people in Laos. Uh, this people is a people group of about 2,000 in the country of Laos and about 95,000 uh, completely all across the world. And so we're going to pray for them specifically. They're the only unreached people. Uh, that is, they're the only people in Laos who haven't had access to the good news of Jesus. And so we're going to pray for them today. Father, we're so thankful that we have heard the good news of Jesus, and though it calls us to repent of our sin, we're so thankful to have received those words, and we pray for the people in Laos, specifically the Mongbua people, that you would provide ways, that you would stir in those in Southeast Asia, that they would uh, be motivated to share your good news, that they would uh, find creative ways to uh, bring this good news to the people. And we pray for those who are believers, um, th those who do uh, know the good news uh, as a part of the Mongbu of people, that they would be preserved and that they would be encouraged, that they would be giving, given boldness and strength to withstand in the faith as you draw near. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to have Bobby Thompson come and give us an announcement. I know, I know, I know you're going, oh, him again. <clears throat> no, uh, first, before I get to what I want to talk about, I want you guys to understand how lucky we are as a campus to get to listen to Dr. Ledbetter. Are you kidding me? I mean, that guy is unbelievable. <laughs> He did 75 generations, and this was not Tom and Joe and th those kind of names. I mean, he did 75 generations of the genealogy of Christ. I mispronounced my kid's name last night. <laughs> That's the difference between me and him, among about a million other things. No, in all seriousness, uh, Mr. Kesterson, Mrs. Clinkenbeard wanted me to come up. Um, and just kind of give an update on something that we uh, started this semester that's gone, I think it's gone extremely well. Um, about a year ago, Mr. Kesterson walked into my office and said, hey, you know, because I, I, I have a business degree from here, and he was wanting to add some things to that, to that business degree, sports management degree, some electives, some things that students can do, and he asked me if I had any ideas. Well, being a radio guy, I said, well, yeah, I might have one. And we started talking through what it would look like to have a broadcasting, podcasting type of course on this campus. Which we and we did some research, and uh, you know, props to those two because they did a lot of the legwork. But you know, we did a lot of research, and we saw that um, schools our size don't offer things like this. 
So we thought this was a perfect opportunity to kind of find another niche, to offer something other schools do not offer. So that's what we, uh, that's what we did. The course is called Digital Content Development. We're just finishing up the first semester. It's been so much fun. It's been, it's been a great, great experience. We have a full media room upstairs in my building, microphones, computer, the whole deal. I've got students recording podcasts. I now have students doing play-by-play -play for the basketball teams. So if this is something, and it, it is jun a junior level, so if this is something that interests you, come see me. It's going to be offered again next fall. But instead of listening to me talk about it, Jet, can you come up here real quick? Jet's one of the students in the, yeah, give Jet a round of applause. Come on now. He's one of the students in this class, and he's done a great job. So I want to let him kind of tell you about it from a student perspective. What's up, everybody? Is that good? Okay. Um, so I've been taking the broadcasting class, and I've enjoyed every moment of it, to be honest. Uh, it, like, it's challenged me to like get out of my comfort zone a little bit, and I think doing play-by-play -play has been fun, um, podcasting, uh, things like that. Um, and the media scene has been really fun. So if it's something that might interest you, I encourage you to take it, especially if you're like an underclassman and you, don't, you have plenty of time to figure out your schedule. I would consider it heavily because it's been fun and uh, I've enjoyed it, especially the broadcasting, doing interviews for basketball games and whatnot. So I've enjoyed it. So. Thanks, Jet. Appreciate it. Anyways, like I said, if you have interest in this, once again, it'll only be in the fall, so come see me during the spring and then see your advisor to see if you have an elective available to take that class, but I'd love to, ha love to see you. I'd love to grow this thing, maybe create more classes out of it. You know, only, only God knows what's going to happen, he's, and, he, and he's got his eye on this campus, so I think big things are going to happen. Thanks. Thank you. We've got a few announcements. First, tonight is the night that our women play at five, our women's basketball team specifically. You can locate them by their red sweaters. Uh, and they play at five o'clock, so come out and support them. Come out after that and support the men's basketball team at seven. Uh, and our theme night for the student section is jersey night, so wear your jerseys. Uh, for these games, encourage you to go out and support both our women's and our men's at five and seven. So then pertaining to your chapel grade, two assignments are due th uh, this Friday. Specifically, we've got your chapel survey, which I posted on the bulletin board for you. Make sure you fill that out. Make sure you put your name so that we give you the, the grade for it. Additionally, the message reflection. So if you haven't reflected over a message yet, reflect over Dr. Ledbetter's or reflect on Thursday, but make sure you turn in your message reflection. Beloved of God, 